Welcome to Myth Informed with your host. I am Brian Edward and Fritz next to me. Today, we are really excited um, about our guest. We're bringing you today Professor Gad Sad. He is a Lebanese Canadian professor and behavioral scientist at the John Molson School of Business at Concordia University in Quebec, Canada. He is also a YouTube content creator. His show is called The Sad Truth. I think you can grab the pun there. You can find that at Gad Sad on YouTube or on Twitter. Additionally, he writes a blog for Psychology Today, and he is also a spitting image of the sixth century Byzantine Emperor Maurice. Welcome. It is incredible. <laughs> it, it really is. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that the the, the painting, the, the guy that painted that um, got it right. And uh, so you have um, found the uh, the key to reincarnation. Except that he is less royal and regal than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but how much money did, did he must? must I think he had have. more money and more women than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but but you are you're definitely loaded with knowledge. And um, for folks that might not know Gad Sad, um, he, he talks a lot about what's going on in the universities, things, uh, worries of censorship, worries of ideology. And um, Myth Informed is, often talks about religion and how r religion can overstep you know, the truth and can get inside of it. But we've kind of shifted our focus to look at authoritarian ideologies. And that's kind of what we wanted to talk about today. And specifically, are those invading the university? And is this a threat to the university as we know it? Well, uh, thank you for having me. It's it's great to finally be on your show. Uh, look, uh, religion uh, has a certain structure to it and that there are certain dogmas, certain revealed truths that no amount of information can falsify. And some of the idea pathogens that currently parasitize the university have the exact same structure. They are revealed truths. Uh, it's a secular religion. Uh, but it is equally a departure from reason. And so in that sense, you're just replacing one set of dogma, religious dogma, with another set of dogma. And both should be uh, combated assiduously. So, so what bring us back to like an idea pathogen. So for somebody that says, okay, that's that's a cool term, but what, what do you mean exactly by an idea pathogen? So let me, this is actually the, the point, forgive for the plug, my forthcoming book where what I basically do is I take the model of an epidemiologist. So if you, if you imagine an epidemiologist who is trying to identify where a particular pathogen, a virus, a bacterium has started, who is patient zero, how has it spread, what is its transmissibility rate, and so on. Uh, and I take this model and I argue that in the same way that we can be uh, infected by viruses, in the same way that many organisms can be parasitized by actual brain worms, right? Toxoplasma gandhi, as many of your listeners might know, is a parasite that infects the, the brains of mice. When the mice are infected with this parasite, they become sexually attracted to the urine of a cat. And so their adaptive fear of cats is now squashed and they actually head towards the cat and it results in a maladaptive outcome. Well, I argue that humans suffer from another class of parasites instead of them being actual brain worms, they're bad ideas. They're ideas that uh, parasitize us and cause us to behave in profoundly maladaptive ways. So an example of that, and I go through a whole list in my book, uh, I think before before we got on air, we talked about postmodernism. Well, postmodernism is a, is a grand daddy, daddy of idea pathogens. It basically says that there are no universal truths, everything is relative. And so it becomes very difficult to be a scientist if you, argue that there are no universal truths. We, we wake up every day as scientists hoping to come as close as we can to some truth using the scientific method. If you now argue that there are no such things as objective truths, uh, it leads us down some very ugly uh, pathways, such as it is uh, you know sexist or transphobic to argue that there's such a thing as male or female. I had to, in the 21st century, in 2017, appear in front of the Canadian Senate as an evolutionary behavioral scientist to argue in front of the Canadian Senate in the 21st century that no, 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 trust me, there is such a thing as male and female. Well, when you get to that kind of level of lunacy, uh, you can only talk about idea pathogens parasitizing our ability to think clearly. You know, so with, with these ideas, you know, the fact that you had to go so high uh, in uh, your 
you know, politics to speak about this, you know, the fact that there's man and woman. Uh, within the scientific community, uh, you know, I try to picture myself uh, as, like I had stated to you, a bacteriology major. I'm, I'm in college studying microbiology. If I'm focused on my science, why should I care what these idiots are thinking and, and spewing? Um, is there really a concern uh, for scientists that are actually doing the work? Won't science just keep moving forward, marching on, and this is just a blip in, uh, in humankind? Yes and no. So I'll give you a, a few ways to address your, your, your valid question. Uh, it only took 19 committed people on 9-11 to bring down buildings. It didn't take 19,000. It didn't take 19 million. It didn't take 190 million. It took only 19. So you don't need many morons and social justice warriors on campus to be holding the rest of us hostage, right? And that's exactly what happens. You are exactly correct that they are a small minority. They're a vocal, very strident small minority that causes that causes everyone to pause and think and you know take a step before they ultimately engage in self-censorship. Now you might have thought that yes, biology and physics and neuroscience and chemistry are uh, somehow inoculated from this lunacy. They're not. I recently had a few months ago on my show, Professor Alessandro Strumia, who is a physicist, a theoretical physicist, who is a guy who worked at CERN, the nuclear research center uh, headquartered in uh, uh, Switzerland. And he appeared at a conference that was on gender and theoretical physics, where he offered some bibliometric data. Bibliometric data, for those of you who don't know, is the study of science networks, for example, who cites whom, uh, and so on. And what he wanted to demonstrate is that contrary to the politically correct narrative, contrary to the oppression Olympics narrative that women are grossly discriminated against in physics, if you look at the bibliometric data, it's not true. That narrative is false, right? Now, he didn't know any better. He thought, well, as a physicist, you know, he goes where the data takes him. And so he's just going to present that data. Well, he's been let go of CERN now. Uh, 1,600 physicists uh, who came together under the profoundly obnoxious Particles for Justice moniker wow. put out a letter, a signatory letter, uh, whereby they distanced themselves from this monster, this Nazi who, you know, violated people's race and sexual orientation and gender expression. He did no such thing. All he did was report bibliometric data on male versus female physicists. So the cancer uh, doesn't know where the boundaries end. It's not restricted to the humanities or to the social sciences. This is where it starts off. This is where patient zero is first infected, but it is now making its way to all of the fields that you would have thought you'd be inoculated from. Yeah. And I would, uh, to add to that, I, I, I heard about this on, I would think it was Janice Fiamengo's channel from the University of Ottawa. And, and she mentioned that what that hubbub was about was that, that male physicists were being cited more often than female scientists. And that this, the claim of sexism was there. But when you actually looked at this, female physicists were citing male physicists more often as well. It was just that that happened to be who it was the best work or the, the, the most the, the most pertinent work. And, and it, it, it just, that boggled my mind that when women themselves are citing men more often and that the actual physicists, why, why do we care about the activists? Like that, it's, it's bizarre. Uh, by the way, the, the, the answer to this, if I put on my uh, red social justice warrior wig for a moment, uh, that's because those women who are citing the male physicists are simply exhibiting internalized patriarchal oppression, right? And so they're exhibiting, you know, a Stockholm syndrome type of manifestation yeah. whereby they are citing, right? So the, the lunacy never ends, no amount of data. That's why I said at the start of the show that it is exactly in structure similar to religious dogma. There is absolutely no way to disprove it. There's no way to falsify it. And this is why I call it a parasite because it's very, very difficult to engage it. You simply have to eradicate it. Yeah, it sounds like a lot like the argument of, you no, know, you're an atheist. It's not that you don't believe in God. You just want to sin. Right? I mean, that, that seems to be the defense. And they're like, hey. Or if I were Jordan Peterson, I would say that when God sad says that he's not an atheist, he really means that he's a believer. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> well, I'm going to quick read a super chat out where we got a, a bit of a pause. Um, so here, Gad, you're not going to get complimented on your uh, your mind here, but but rather your skin. So uh, Miles Snizlow says, hey, guys, love the show. Must say, Dr. Sad, your skin always looks great. What is the secret? Brown skin oh, don't crack? Thank you. Well, part of it is just genetics. So that I can't control. And part of it is living a healthy life. I mean, other than the sin of having gained weight after my uh, soccer career. I've always lived a healthy life. I don't drink. I've never smoked. I exercise a lot. Coupled with good genes results in glorious olive smooth skin. Wow. I expected you to pull out some, uh, you know, a bar of lotion and you know, just, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, get a little commercial. My, my question that I wanted to ask regarding social justice and all these ideas of political correctness, identity politics, uh, did this begin uh, just from people's goodwill, just wanting to be nice to others, just uh, wanting to respect others, and it just went downhill in this slippery slope, and the, the, the snowball just kept getting bigger and bigger? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and I actually exactly discussed this in the book because it's, it's one thing to simply talk about that these idea pathogens exist and where they came about, but you know why did they arise? I mean, to the extent that almost all of these pathogens uh, started with intellectuals, Right. I mean, we'd like to think that intellectuals are not morons. Right. And so why would they believe in such nonsense? Right. I mean, how could it be that many of them hold views that the average two year old would falsify in their just lived experience? And I think it's exactly because of what you said. So let's let's take a few examples. Uh, if, for example, I think that evolutionary thinking and biology will result in a whole bunch of Cretans misusing it for their political purposes. So, for example, a British class elitist in the 19th century argued, hey, uh, we are the upper class, you guys are the lower class, there is a natural struggle between the classes and you lost, so who cares if you die in your you know, squalor? That's just Darwinian theory. Uh, the Nazis said, hey, there's a class between the races, we are the Aryans, sorry Jews, you lost, so what if we kill you? That's just Darwinian theory. Eugenicists argued the same thing when they are purifying the gene pool. And so because all sorts of, uh, you know, Cretans misuse Darwinian theory, and none of this has anything to do with evolutionary theory, uh, a bunch of cultural anthropologists came up with the brilliant idea that if we now abdicate biology in explaining human behavior, then we can stop people from use, misusing evolutionary theory, right? Which, of course, is a just astonishingly imbecilic idea because that's like arguing that's like arguing, let's stop believing that there is such a thing as atomic power because, bruh, what if somebody does the Manhattan Project, right? Uh, science exists in its form. Truth exists uh, irrespective of whether there are downstream ill consequences, right? And so cultural anthropology developed over the next 100 years. It started with Franz Boas at Columbia University and then his students, Margaret Mead and the rest of the schmucks, uh, they all came out with theories that argued that there is no such thing as human universals. Every cultural, every culture is relativistic. You have to look at it within its own context. That's what led to the idea of moral relativism. Who are we to judge if some cultures wish to, as Sam Harris said, gouge out the, the, the eyes of every fourth child? If that's their culture, who are we to judge? And so I think we can go through each of these idea pathogens and at the root of the idea pathogen is, is a, quote, noble cause where you're trying to ameliorate the human condition. But again, I always say uh, we should all strive for uh, justice, but not by murdering truth, right? You, you, don't, you, you don't pursue, for example, I can be completely for transgender rights, as I am. I believe that every single person should live uh, free of bigotry, live with full dignity, but I don't have to murder truth in order to pursue that, right? I don't have to remove the biological marker of 99.9% uh, .9 of people who do identify as cis-normatively binary because I'd like to protect the feelings of the 0.01% who don't, right? And so that balance, regrettably, many of these folks argued, well, we will kill truth in the pursuit of justice, and that's simply wrong. With, with the victim Olympics that is happening right now, uh, what is the end goal? We're, we're, what would be the potential end game? Uh, you know, we have white supremacy. Uh, I'm assuming that, 
you know, uh, white males, which in, in some ideas are considered to be the, the most horrific thing known to man, what would be the end game? Is it just reverse now where some other culture or race is now the supremacist? And then we would be here a thousand years later saying, this is now the supremacist and now we have to get to the white male. Cause I mean, we look at colleges, more women get into college. Uh, we look at, uh, 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 admissions to college. Uh, we see minorities in, in many cases getting preferential treatment. Uh, I'm starting to see now that unless you're Asian, yeah, unless you're Asian, but I'm starting to see now that even in England, there are some universities which are realizing that white males are now getting uh, admitted at such low numbers that now they have to be recruited. So what is the end game with all of this? Well, who, who ends up at the top? Right. Well, uh, certainly not the white males. If the if the current uh, you know miscreants win this battle of ideas, uh, just to speak to your point about uh, you know number of women being more than men, and I'll come back to your more general question. Uh, I in one of my sad truth clips, I uh, discuss data from the U.S. government that had looked at uh, four levels of educational attainment in the United States. So associate's degree. So for Canadian fans who are watching associate degree in the US is roughly half a, it's half a bachelor's community college then the bachelor's degree then master's degree and then doctoral degrees so four levels of education across five races black white hispanic and so on and so there were 20 cells that you could look at four levels of education by five races and in each of the cells you can calculate the ratio of males to females who've graduated within that cell. So there are 20 possible cells. Now, if the female victimology narrative is correct, the 20 out of 20 cells would exhibit, you know, would show more men than women. Can either of you guess what the actual data showed? I don't want to. I think it's zero out of 20 cells. Ding, 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 ding. You win our new car. 20 <laughs> out of 20 cells. Let me repeat that. For people who are dozing off 20 every single racial group and every single level of educational attainment women outnumber men what is the conclusion we draw from this women really have it hard in universities we need to come up with more strategies to try to make it safer from their for them in universities so my point is so to speak to your more general question the currency today that we use in when we debate one another is no longer a mechanism of reason of truth seeking it truly is one where victimology currency is the is the currency that we use to decide who's right and until we break this full epistemological approach right uh, i mean i literally use this by the way as someone who's you know lebanese arabic from the middle east you know war refugee and all this i always joke that no one certainly no one in the west probably most people in the world can't outrank me in victimology poker just by, by my personal history. I will often, whenever I get someone attacking me, some uh, Forbes journalist, white woman, and I know she's going to succumb to this type of oppression in the Olympics, I start tweeting at her, why are you attacking you know, a hapless war refugee, a brown man? A, and guess what? She runs away. So I could literally turn this game against these morons and they simply cannot handle it. So uh, the end game is uh, if we win, meaning truth seekers, we have to get rid of the currency of victimology and return to being committed to winning arguments using reason, logic, evidence-based thinking, the scientific method. Now that sounds obvious to many of your viewers, but believe me, as somebody who lives in the ecosystem of the university every single day, it's not very obvious in my ecosystem. Right. It, it's not because I'm uh, I'm often hearing that that science itself is a product of white colonialism. Right. And instead of these ideas in science being a universal truth and for everyone, that this was a system created by white people to afford and support white people, which is odd because Asians seem to be doing the best in the United States. So somehow white people set up a system that's that that helps Asians the most, but like, are you seeing this this colonial backlash? And if you, is that a force on the university? Oh, listen, I have a section in my. Uh, forgive me for mentioning my forthcoming book. It's not it's not to constantly plug plug it, just to kind of so that I can 
auto cite myself if you'd like, because you'll be seeing it in the book. This is why uh, you're here. We want to plug your book. <laughs> well, thank you. You're very kind. Uh, uh, so I talk about this uh, movement to speak to your point uh, of the indigenization of Canadian universities. So the indigenization happens in, in several ways. Uh, indigenization could be uh, when you have a uh, uh, an event at the let's say graduation. You first start off by saying, uh, we apologize, this is Iroquois and Algonquin land, self-flagellate, I apologize for, you know, right? I had nothing to do with what happened in 1739 with a particular tribe. And the students who are who spent four years studying hard at this university should not start off by feeling collectively guilty for something that happened 300 years ago. But that notwithstanding, let's call it a symbolic attempt at reconciliation and clear that. We'll accept that. That's fine. Here's where indigenization becomes a problem. When you argue, as you exactly said, that the scientific method is just one way of knowing, and the way of knowing of science is really that it was white males who came up with science, right? Newton and Darwin and all those disgusting white guys. Uh, and there are other ways of knowing, indigenous way of knowing. No, there is no indigenous way. There is no Lebanese Jewish way of knowing. There is no French Canadian way of knowing. There is the scientific method. Now, what you could have is if you have indigenous people who have lived in a particular land for 10,000 years, then they're likely to have very intimate knowledge of the flora and fauna of that particular ecosystem. And therefore, it's perfectly appropriate and plausible to argue that they have content-specific knowledge that some Harvard zoologist sitting in his office in Boston does not have. So in that sense, that's fine. But they don't get knowledge. They don't generate knowledge. They don't have an epistemology that is different from the scientific method. And yet, that's exactly what's happening at Canadian universities. Even our Quebec uh, environmental minister got into a lot of hot water because he said, what do you mean we're going to do environmental impact studies using indigenous ways of knowing? There's just the scientific method. And he had to walk that back and self-flagellate at the altar of progressivism because it was horrifyingly racist what he said. So once we've gotten to uh, accept this kind of nonsense in the 21st centuries at universities, uh, someone has to speak up. And that's why you often see me very indignant about this kind of bullshit. Yeah, I mean, it's worth looking into, you know, uh, how indigenous, uh, like how, how oral cultures passed on knowledge and how they did it with story and song and how they would teach their children about the seasons, about even what what an eclipse might be and, and and stories for all of this this is this is a fine way to go back and learn but to say that that was providing some kind of special knowledge that it, it just seems bizarre i mean the scientific method is a universal it's for all humans it's yeah. for aliens that might live on on another planet somewhere it, it's not it's not for a race well i would say it's okay but it's not going to be the best way to transmit uh, information to have it be accurate because it's going to change over time. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, you know cultures, uh, in terms of cultures, and I guess under the umbrella of all cultures are equal. What do you say, or what's your take on, for instance, the Jewish community worldwide having more like Nobel prizes than the Islamic community in general? Uh, what do you what do you have to to say about that? And what do you think social justice warrior individuals have to say? regarding this aspect they just say it's just white supremacy again with the nobel prize right right uh well i've actually used uh, the data regarding nobel prizes uh won by jews when uh, i spoke i gave a university-wide address at the university of regina uh, a few years ago where i was talking about you know uh, uh, inclusion diversity and equity whereby we're now giving out chaired professorships not only in my university but at the Canadian level, the Canadian government now gives out chaired professorships, the highest accolade in academia, based on whether you are, whether you ovulate or not, whether you are indigenous or not. And so I said, but wait a second, if we look at data of Boston marathon runners, and I started going through the list, and this became known as the Kenya, Kenya, Kenya meme, I let me let me summarize it for you. Here are the winners. Kenya, 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 Ethiopia, Kenya, 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 Kenya. You, you're getting the general uh, thing. And so I argued, how come the identity 
uh, politics folks are not arguing for that. What about the 100 meters winner in the Olympics? What about the, uh, the Nobel Prize, to come to your point, where Jews, who are roughly 15 million people on Earth, right, uh, have about one quarter of Nobel Prizes. Uh, so this shows you what, what a shoddy practice it is to talk about equality of outcomes. Uh, equality of opportunities is fine. Equality of outcomes is moronic. But to speak to your point, why are there so many Jews who win? Uh, I'll just give you a personal anecdote that might speak to, to your question. When I finished my MBA and I was going on to pursue my PhD, I always knew, I mean, I always had two interests in life. I was going to be a professional soccer player and I was a very good soccer player. And then I had some career ending injuries and I always knew that I was going to go into academia. And so getting these injuries simply sped my trajectory towards academia. So I finished my MBA and I was heading towards my PhD and I had gone to uh, California to uh, visit one of the schools that had accepted me. UC Irvine had accepted me, one of several schools that had accepted me for my PhD. And it so happens that my I had a brother who uh, lived in California who had become very wealthy in the software industry. And he was trying to convince me that it might be worthwhile for me after my MBA and prior to going on for my PhD to maybe put on the proverbial suit and work in industry for a few years before I went back to academia. Um, I wasn't really interested in doing that. When I returned home uh, to Montreal and was hanging out with my mother, my mother takes me aside to one of the rooms, you know, to really sort of sit me down for a chat. And she said, well, I'm, I'm hearing that you're thinking about, um, you know, maybe stopping uh, after your MBA now. Uh, you do realize that people are going to think of you as someone, do you want people to think of you as someone who's dropped out of school? Well, I had an MBA, right? I had a I had a bachelor's degree in mathematics and computer science and an MBA, both from a, one of the world's top universities. And yet finishing with an MBA to my mother would have been something that was shameful. This is something that people would have talked about me as someone who dropped out of school. Now, of course, not that I pursued a PhD for my mother or to, you know, to 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 honor her and so on, but that gives you a sense of the kind of standards within our community that we set. So it's not by magic that you see so many Jews doing so well because uh, our culture doesn't glorify violence and uh, you know what some, some other cultures do. We are a, a, a peoples of the book. And I mean, to speak to your point about Islam, as a matter of fact, Islam refers to us as people of the book. Yeah. In, this, in this case, they're talking about people of the book in the sense of being monotheistic religion, but we are truly people of the book. Uh, uh, you know, if I just listed you within my immediate or extended family, the, the, the type of people that exist within my family, it's, it really would be astonishing. So I, I can't speak. I mean, I know some people argue that there's, there's also a genetic factor. If you look at IQ tests of the Jews and so on, uh, we, can, we can leave that aside. Just the culture, the culture of expectation is such that the threshold of success is set so high that even if you were to not meet that threshold, you're going to be successful. Right. I, I, I always think, too, and what, what do you think about this argument, that if we rewind back to, say, 1100 AD, it, we'd almost expect the Renaissance to take place in the Middle East ra rather than Europe. And, and it seems like that the two, the battle, the major philosophical battle between Averroes and Al-Ghazali that was taking place at that time, and Al-Ghazali kind of turned inward and said that he rejected that that was the, the ignorance of the philosophers. And Islam kind of went with that. And then Thomas Aquinas, the, the, the Catholic theologian, borrowed from the other Muslim of Aries and cracked open and said, well, no, God has made these laws. They're immutable and we can understand them. Right. I mean, do you feel like that that is the, the cultural shift? And if that hadn't happened and say it Averroes won, would, would the Renaissance have taken place in the Middle East and we'd see a wildly different world? I mean, it's, it's tough to play sort of the rewinding game, but but certainly that makes sense. Uh, there's a book, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain I'm going to get the title wrong, I think. And I haven't read it, but the, the thesis is certainly an interesting one. I think it might be called The Closing of the Muslim Mind, maybe a play on the book by Alan Bloom, The Closing of the American Mind, uh, where, they, where he talks about that bifurcation that happened, I think a bit earlier than the 11th century, where... Uh, some people, some you know, one one group of Muslim uh, thinkers and scholars thought that it was appropriate to use reason to to question the mind of God, to question nature, and and the other group, and I can't remember their names, although I'm 
my 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 mother tongue is Arabic. I can't remember the terms in Arabic, but there were two camps. And regrettably, the camp that sort of turned inward that didn't want to. So I think it's exactly what you're saying, but push it back maybe a, a century or two. Okay. Uh, so so I think I mean you're you're exactly right. And I mean I I see it. Uh, as having as someone who grew up in the Middle East till the age of eleven, and then of course lived within in the Middle Eastern community, there is this very fatalistic. Even as a Lebanese Jew, there is this fatalistic uh, uh, way by which you attribute everything to godly causes. There are there are all sorts of expressions that you use. Uh, if you see a beautiful flower, if you see a beautiful animal, everything is attributed to to God. And that used to really piss me off growing up as a young child. People ask me, "What? How did I turn off religion?" Well, because my intellectual curiosity is not something that I developed when I turned 21. It's it's an inherent element of my personhood. And when I would go to the synagogue in, in Beirut and I would ask my father, okay, what, why are we standing up now? Why are we sitting? Why are we doing the Macarena now? Why are we going left? Why are we going right while we're praying? His answer was always just shut up and do. And I always found that to be very uh, offensive, uh, even as a young child. And so that debate that you're talking about in the 11th century is one that I experienced on a more microscopic level with my dad. I didn't turn inward. I wanted to understand everything. And right there, I thought that religion was a bunch of crap. Wouldn't that be, like? it seems like these kind of things, right? The, the Christians burning books and, and then the, the, in Baghdad, like the Islamic world saves m many of the Greek texts. And then it flips, right? And then it, the, the, the Muslim world turns inward and then Christianity opens up a little bit. Wouldn't this be a great topic for cultural anthropology to really get into? Because it almost makes sense is a discipline in this way. I mean, did cultural anthropology, I mean, to bring it back to the university, have they always, did they set out with a goal to prove or or was this co-opted at some point? Uh, to, to prove what? I missed the-, the... I mean, I mean, because you could make an argument that, that cultural anthropology would be a good discipline because I mean, look at the, the example that we just gave about yeah. why didn't the Renaissance happen in the Islamic world? I mean, that that's it's fine to see how religion and culture interacted there and to, to make sense of that. But why is culture anthropology? Because you, you took a big rip at it earlier in the podcast. What what what's the biggest problem with culture anthropology right yeah, now? How to yeah, that's 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 a that's a great question. So, I think uh, maybe the best way to answer this uh, is to delineate two levels of explanation scientifically. In evolutionary theory, you talk about the distinction between proximate explanations and ultimate explanations. Proximate explanations is where much of science lies. It explains the how and the what of a phenomenon. Uh, if I wanna understand how diabetes works, uh, well, it's a proximate question. You know, how does it work? What are the factors that affect the spike in, in, in my uh, you know, blood sugar levels? So all Nobel, most Nobel prizes have been won for work done at the proximate level. That's great. Evolutionary theory offers another epistemological level of explanation, and it's called the ultimate level. Ultimate doesn't mean superior, not ultimate in a hierarchical sense. Ultimate in the sense that if you unfold the causal explanation, you get to the ultimate Darwinian why. Why has something evolved to be of that form, okay? And I'm gonna come to your cultural uh, question in a second. So the problem, I think, epistemologically speaking, with cultural anthropology, is that it operates simply as a phenomenological discipline. It simply catalogs cultural expressions. Look, the Malaysians do it this way and the French do it that way. And that's different from how the Brazilians do, way, do it. And it's, it's not quite like how the Mayans do it 1600 years ago. Now that's all nice, but that's all proximate stuff. A much more interesting question to ask, or rather a more complete question to ask, is why do cultures evolve along their particular trajectories? And so let me give you a tangible uh, example of how you would apply an ultimate level analysis to a cultural question. So if I were to look at the culinary traditions, the cuisine traditions around the world, let's say in terms of how much a particular cuisine uses spices, some, some cuisines are very spicy, Mexican food. Other cuisines are very uh, mild, Swedish food. Well, if I'm a cultural anthropologist, what do I do? Mexican is spicy, Swedish is not. Good night, everybody, okay? An evolutionist would say, why 
is Mexican food spicy? And why is Swedish food not spicy? Well, it turns out that it is something intimately linked to something called the antimicrobial hypothesis, which basically argues that culinary traditions evolve in their particular forms as adaptations to biological problems. So in cultures where you have hot weather, where you have therefore a much more rapid proliferation of food pathogens, where there is greater pathogenic load within that ecosystem, then you use culinary traditions to quell that particular adaptive problem. Therefore, spices are used as an antimicrobial property, just like pickling, just like smoking food. And therefore, once you look at the global distribution of spice use and then map it, superimpose it on pathogenic density, voila, you have a full explanation. So to come back to your question, the problem, I think, with cultural anthropology, other than the fact that it has been parasitized by a bunch of completely lobotomized fools, you know, the postmodernists and the, the rest of the, the idiots, uh, even for serious cultural anthropologists, they are very, you know, or cultural psychologists who are very, very rigorous scientists, they're always stuck at the proximate level. And one of the ways to sort of uh, draw an analogy to this ultimate versus proximate distinction is to think, for example, of the electronic microscope or the Hubble telescope, problems at the nano level, at the small level, or at the cosmological level could not be studied if you didn't have those particular tools. By having those particular apparatuses, it opens up the number of research questions that I can tackle. That's what evolutionary theory does at the epistemological level. It allows me to ask questions that heretofore would have been invisible to me. God Damn, I'm good. Go ahead. <laughs> what, 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 what quick uh, super chat from uh, Lee Spanner, who uh, didn't say anything, but to gave $2. We um, appreciate that. Now, I see a lot of this on Twitter, um, but I, I'm, and I might see it in, in uh, coming out of cultural anthropology too, but evolutionary psychology is a pseudoscience. <laughs> how many times have you seen yeah, that? Did, did and, and sound, the last five, 10 minutes that I spoke, did, it, did I sound like a pseudoscientist to you? Not at all. <laughs> no. I mean, and, and okay, but what do you, can you explain the argument to uh, why you think yeah. it's a pseudoscience oh, yeah. you rebut it? Yes, yes. Uh, this is probably of all the uh, attacks on evolutionary psychology, this is the one that annoys me the most be, uh, for two reasons. Number one, because it is, typically stated oftentimes by people who are otherwise educated. So many academics will say exactly that. And secondly, it is the one that where people are uniquely likely to be afflicted with Dunning-Kruger symptom. So <laughs> not, only, not only are they morons, but they are overconfident and arrogant about their imbecilic ways, right? By the way, Dunning was my former professor of psychology at Cornell University. Uh, so wh why do they believe that? It's a very long answer. Let me try to bring it down for you. Uh, one of the reasons is that they think this is called the human reticence effect. Uh, this is not my term. It's someone else's. The human reticence effect is basically the idea that you're willing to accept evolutionary theory explaining the behavior of the salamander and the finch and the zebra and the mosquito. But if you use the exact same evolutionary principles and the exact same methodology and the exact same epistemology to explain human behavior, well, bruh, that's just Nazi faux science. And the reason is because many people somehow view their personhood as distinct from the rest of the biological order, right? What makes us human, according to these idiots, is that we transcend our biology. Now, some of them will be sufficiently charitable as to say, oh, no, no, Dr. Saad, I get it. Evolution is true, but it's true to explain why your pancreas is the way that it is. It is certainly true to explain why you have opposable thumbs. But Dr. Saad, surely you agree that evolution stops at the neck. It can't explain the human mind because the human mind somehow comes about through a magic process. There are aliens that create the human mind. It is outside the realm of evolution. So to the people who say that evolutionary psychology is pseudoscience, they literally are saying, I am a gargantuan moron. I am a flat earther 
of the human mind. So in the exact same way that today we marginalize people who say, I am a flat earther. I don't believe that the earth is round. In 50 years, in 100 years, these Cretans, these enemies of reason will be exactly within the same club. And I often will write back to them when I'm, whenever I want to have fun on Twitter and I'm bored and my wife has fallen asleep and I don't feel like working on my book, I'll spar with some of these idiots. And I usually call them, you know, I'll say, what time is the flat earther society meeting that you're going to? Because that's exactly what they're saying. I mean, all of my colleagues who work in the evolution and behavioral sciences are some of the most intricately sophisticated scientists that exist. And yet some gamer Joe who's gone to grade nine biology who plays video games all day will write to me and say but bro why do you do this it's fake science and so that's what's so galling number one it's profoundly wrong and number two it is stated with such arrogance well yeah and it's not just by like the gamer that might be in the basement it, i think it's by gender studies too i think judith butler says that that gender is performative <laughs> but, it, but it isn't biological. It, it's purely performative. And and what bugs me about this, the, the evolutionary psychology piece, and right, because you're right, they'll say they'll stipulate that the pancreas does this and that. But the religious would say this as well, especially like the old earth creationists, not the young, but the old earth creationists would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Evolution happened with the with mammals and 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 giraffes and and certainly the birds and the Galapagos, but but not with humans. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's yeah. the human resistance effect. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it, so it really seems like and we would debunk that. I mean, the atheist community would often say, well, th that's absurd. Right? Yeah, the, uh, you can't, it, champion, if a fish is evolving, well, certainly that humans have to be subject to that. But no, 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 no. Humans are special. And it seems like the, the culture anthropologists and those and in the name of anti-bigotry are making the same anti-science mistake. Yeah, it's incredible how the secular world and the religious world are overlapping here with human exceptionalism is not part of the animal kingdom. Exactly. Uh, you know, bo both say the exact same thing. Uh, wh where do you see with, uh, you know, censorship, for instance, you know, your ability to, uh, obviously you're extremely uh, knowledgeable and you can explain yourself well. Where is censorship going right now? We see Facebook right now censorship, uh, censoring uh, you know, white supremacy. Uh, we see right now uh, censorship when it, as it relates to scientific information and the scientific method. Uh, where are we heading right now with, with censorship? It, it seems to be a very scary time right now. Like we can't really speak our mind. Like free speech is something that I grew up with, assuming that this is the way of the world. Yeah, you should be able to speak your mind. And uh, I, I assume that you know, as my life would go on, things would just get freer. And it seems now that we're getting, we're kind of reverting to a situation where we can't even speak our mind anymore. No, it's, look, it's, it, it keeps me up at night. I mean, this is why I do what I do, because uh, to the extent that I've got uh, a forum uh, to try to combat this, I always feel, I mean, people tell me, why do you, why, why do you care so much about getting engaged? And, you know, what compels you to get engaged? And my personal code of conduct is, if at the end of the night I'm going to have a good night's sleep, I need to be able to lay my head on my pillow and not feel any guilt at having engaged in inaction uh, when I could have acted, right? And so uh, to the extent that I have a forum, I always feel that I have to you know, fight for these causes. So, but to come back to your question, uh, it, it's not just censorship in the classic sense of, oh, the government stopping you that I'm worried about. Probably the greatest form of censorship or the most harmful form is really self-censorship, right? It's when a student who is sitting in a class who would like to say, but come on, surely there is such a thing as evolved sex differences, decides that they better not say that. It's when someone says, but I think I have some good reasons as to why many people who are not bigots and didn't sleep with their sisters in Arkansas voted for Donald Trump. Very reasonable and rational people might have used some very valid psychological processes to choose Donald Trump. He or she will decide not to speak in class. So I think censorship is not simply about, you know, is the government going to stop us from freely holding this chat on your show? It's creating a zeitgeist, a, a, an ethos, a, a moment, a cultural moment where people are either feeling uh, empowered, emboldened to speak out or whether they are afraid to speak. And the reality is on a daily basis in my life as a professor, 
I see censorship's tentacles everywhere. I mean, I'll give you one quick example. Lisa, I think Littman is a physician and a professor uh, at uh, Brown University. She published a paper in Plus One uh, looking at a sort of rapid onset uh, gender dysphoria, whereby, you know, a whole community of people suddenly, you know, every child within that community is transgendered, right? And she, you know, she's a very reasonable, very, you know, gently spoken person who, you know, is a serious academic. Uh, she published this paper in Plus One, it's a very serious journal. And then uh, first Brown University advertised the paper as they would, and then they pulled it when trans activists started, you know, screaming and yelling. So that's not censorship in the sense of the government censoring you, but this is someone standing and saying, do you really want to do this? And most people who lack testicular fortitude are going to run away from brawls. A few of us are actually always there at the challenge, right? If you come after me, I'm going to come after you 10 times harder. Maybe it's my Middle Eastern culture. Maybe it's the unique combination of my genes. I'm just built for that fight. But most people don't have the stomach for it, and therefore they will self-censor. So to answer your question in a hopefully not too long-winded way, uh, we need to clip those shackles so that everyone in a free society always feels emboldened to speak their mind. Yeah, now we what? see we see human resources uh, campaigns. You know, I, I've I've experienced it well, and it's you've heard it. Equity, diversity, inclusion. Uh, you know, these are things that are being pushed in in many different job places. Uh, people are afraid to speak out because it's their livelihood. So my question to you is: Is it worth being a martyr? How many martyrs do we need? And how do you encourage, I guess, your students to speak their mind, you know, when, you know, you seem to feel secure with your livelihood, at least that's the confidence that you're exuding. Uh, you know, what do, what do we need to make this happen? Do we just need people to just get on a rooftop and just stop ye start yelling a bunch of uh, craziness? Right. So let me first disabuse the notion of I'm secure in my job because I'm tenured. Uh, last year, I had to go to university and check in with security whenever I lectured. Uh, they would lock the door from the outside so that if students left the room, they could, but if they had to come back in, it was locked because of the number of death threats I was receiving. HR of my university uh, compelled me to go to the Montreal police and file a police report. A file was opened because of the number of death threats I was receiving. When I would go to the university, my wife would drop me I would then lecture and then rush back into the car. And literally when I would enter the car, a, a weight, a, a thousand pounds would be lifted off my uh, shoulders because I'm going to live another week uh, and being with my children. So it's not as though tenure is a magic cloak that protects you from all repercussions. So I would ask the idiots who think that, oh, but, surely you're not courageous because you're tenured to send me their address so that I can forward them the death threats and then they could talk to me about tenure. So that's number one. Number two, I've been denied two uh, applications of a chaired professorship. As a matter of fact, I corrected you offline when I remember that I'm the holder of the Concordia University Research Chair in Evolution. That's from 2008 to 2018. I've now applied two years in a row. I didn't get that chair. I'll leave it at that, okay? Uh, so there are an endless number of ways by which someone could be severely punished from minor things to being afraid to walk into campus because of death threats that still cause me to speak out. So don't in any way think that because I'm tenured, that removes any of the credit that I should have. If anything, I've, uh, the amount, the costs that I've had to bear, uh, that have harmed my career because of how outspoken I am have been incalculable. For example, I've long wanted to relocate to Southern California. I've had uh, at least one university who's, who wanted to come and hire me at a gigantic salary. And then because of political ramifications, that uh, offer was ultimately withdrawn off the table. So again, uh, tenure is not the panacea to all your costs. But to answer your question more generally, the way I would answer people who say, but, you know, I don't want to be a martyr. Uh, you know, I want to be safe. Uh, and I don't 
wish to be hyperbolic here, I'm being quite literal actually. When the young men who stormed Normandy did so, nobody told them, but when you storm, don't worry, we guarantee you, you won't get hurt. hurt. You won't get killed. You won't get mowed down like little mosquitoes by the machine guns of the Nazis. It is because those guys went on that shore that you and I are sitting and talking today. So yes, you might bear a cost. And yes, there will be injuries to your career, to your livelihood. But we stand today on the, on the shoulders of very courageous men and women who gave everything so that we could stand. I had to escape Lebanon sprinting because if I got caught, my head would be disassociated from the rest of my body. Uh, so for me, it's unthinkable that I wouldn't speak out. So what would I say to all those people? Don't be an unnecessary martyr. In other words, you can be slightly strategic, uh, but ultimately, if you diffuse the responsibility onto others, we will lose that battle. Or for us to win the battle, many more... Uh, edifices of truth will have to be destroyed. So why don't you get engaged in any way that you can? For example, you could be as you could do as little as when you see someone posting some BS on Facebook that you disagree with, challenge it politely, right? So it's trench warfare. It's ideological warfare on every street corner. Some of us have bigger forums. Some of us are professors with huge followings. Others of us are not. But at every step of the junction of this battle, let your voice be heard. Don't diffuse the responsibility on a few of us to bear the burden for everyone else. Yeah. I, and I see you a lot in your work where you, you'll say that people and, and professors especially will email you a lot and say, hey, thanks for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. It's, it's bad at our university. I, I just can't, I can't speak out. And, and you've criticized that while, while you appreciate it. You, you criticize it saying, and that that silence can be complicity and and i kind of get that i i it, it makes some sense you know that alexander schultz knits in 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 the as in the gulag archipelago talks about how nobody spoke up and and the train keeps rolling back but it, but to push back on it the social justice warriors will often say you're complicit if you don't immediately call out racism and therefore you're white supremacist adjacent so my, uh, I had a little bit, because they say silence is violence or com silence is complicity as well. How would you take that critique? Uh, they're wrong uh, because I, I, the reason why I always come to the table with uh, the uh, supreme confidence is uh, because I come from first principles. In other words, I so believe that I am capable of defeating you in a battle of ideas on whatever issue that I'm willing to fight you against, that I am never afraid to enter the ring with you. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, that I don't have deep epistemic humility, right? As a, as a scientist, when I collect data and I analyze the data and the data doesn't support my hypothesis, oh, back to the drawing board. And if you offer me some uh, evidence-based, uh, well, some evidence that demonstrates that my position is wrong, I'm perfectly willing to go back to the board and restart. But when I come to a debate, uh, I will let you know that I'm ready to fight. And therefore, if I'm ready to fight, I don't have to be silent. In other words, because people actually often write to me and say, how do you have the courage to do? All? I mean, I can't understand how you could exist. I mean, especially at my university. I mean, it's social justice warrior central, right? I mean, if you've seen my videos, my satirical videos, my self-flagellation stuff, I mean, people can't do, can't imagine doing one millionth of what I do. Well, the reason why I do it is because I'm indignant about how much these other cretins are attacking truth. And therefore, I come like a brawler. And so uh, the social justice warriors are wrong. And this is why ultimately they never enter the arena you know, to battle with me on, on substantive points. They can usually only use social justice tactics and I will usually flip that on them because I outrank them in victimology poker. I'll give you a very quick, short example. I was uh, attacked by a woman on Twitter because I had the audacity of critiquing Serena Williams when she was acting like an utter buffoon uh, uh, in the US Open, the final right? When she acted, you know, in a very inappropriate way. And 
as I have a right to do, and as you would expect, unless you suffer from you know the the uh, bigotry of what is the soft bigotry of low expectations, uh, Serena Williams doesn't get a pass from uh, from being called out for her assholeish behavior because she's a woman and because she's black, right? Uh, that's what non-racism is, right? If it were a Jewish guy who did it, I would think he's an asshole. And if it's Serena Williams who does it, I think she's an asshole because by first principles, an asshole is an asshole irrespective of their identity. Well, this white woman thought that it was completely outside the bounds of proper discourse for me to publicly criticize a black woman. Therefore, I must be racist, I must be sexist. She started to tag my university. She wanted my university to fire a chaired professor with my dossier because I dared criticize Serena Williams. Well, guess what I did? I didn't run away, I didn't close my Twitter account. I went so hard after her, she didn't know what hit her. She canceled her Twitter account. Then she wrote back to me from a new account and said, could you please remove all the tweets that I wrote? I said, no, I'm not gonna remove anything. And then she said, well, I'm going to then sue you for libel and defamation. She attacks me, tries to get me fired. When I shine the light of truth on her, my right of moral indignation on her, she then becomes the victim. Guess what? She went away. So ultimately, that's what I mean by don't be complicit in your silence. Not all of us have the right makeup to be a brawler like I am, but all of us have the capacity to lend a small voice, a whisper to the battle of ideas. The problem comes from something called the tragedy of the commons, if I can explain it. And now you're getting another section of my forthcoming book. The tragedy of the commons is an economic principle that basically says, suppose you've got a plot of land where 10 farmers are using that land for their livestock to graze on it. And they come to a communal agreement whereby they all say, we are going to all stop using this land for grazing so that it can recover. So for the next two years, here's a gentleman's agreement, let's all shake hands, nobody uses that land. And we all agree to it. Now, one farmer says, you know what's the real optimal solution here? Is for me to cheat on the contract, I will still use the land for my livestock and the other nine farmers will all be honorable and will stick true to the contract. Now, the tragedy in the commons is, each one of the farmers thinks that and they all do it and hence therefore the collusion is broken. Well, how do we apply the tragedy of the commons to what we're talking about here? Each person says, I'm too busy with my life. I'm afraid to lose my job. It's my daughter's graduation ceremony. I have to focus on that. Let Gat Sad worry about it. I'll diffuse the responsibility to him. And he says it and she says it and he says it and therefore only four of us speak out. But if everyone had the courage to not succumb to the tragedy of the commons, to speak out when they're supposed to, our silent majority voices would drown out the few social justice warriors that are holding the rest of us hostage. That's a great application to the tragedy of the commons. I, I was uh, familiar with it in the environmental aspect. You know, one person throws one piece of litter, not a big deal, right? My piece of litter. But now if a billion people, six billion people think it's just one piece of litter, now you got six billion pieces of, of litter um, you know, in the world. With, with your battling of ideas uh, and uh, you, know, you being against uh, the ideas of trigger warnings and snowflakes and safe spaces, I guess, uh, what offends you? Great question. What offends me is intellectual dishonesty. What offends me is the murder of truth. What's beautiful about our societies is freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and the commitment to reason, to logic, to science. That's what allows us to today have a Google Hangouts, which will be viewed hopefully by many people. It's science that led to that. It's not booga booga thinking. It's not Judaism. It's not Islam. It's not the social justice warriors. So what liberates the human mind what frees us from the shackle of bullshit is a commitment to reason, to logic, to science, right? So we could engage with one another politely. We could be, you know, kind to each other. But ultimately, I cannot tolerate you coming at me and murdering truth. It's sort of like a bystander effect. If I see 
uh, if a woman is being accosted in a dark alley, maybe 10 guys will pass by. Nine of them won't do anything. Well, guess what? I'm the guy who's going to step in and say, hey, you can't do that. And so what offends me is seeing instead of that lady being accosted in the alley is truth being accosted, truth being killed, truth being raped on a daily basis in social media, on, on and mainstream, you know, in, in universities, in organizations. And so, and, and that, that's precisely why it's such a burden to bear because the second that you put yourself out, I mean, I could close all my social media so at least that I can inoculate myself from all the bullshit, but I can't. Because every day when I go to sleep, I say, you know, did I contribute to create slightly less litter today? And just to draw a, a, a small example uh, related to your litter uh, example, I taught my children from a very young age, whenever we'd go to the beach, that when we go to the beach, uh, as we, you know, before we leave the beach, let's just walk 100 meters this way and 100 meters that way and pick up some trash. And so even if we picked up, say, 20 pieces of trash, it's an incre incredibly purifying feeling. Because we stood here, because we used this natural resource, we just freed this beautiful place of these 20 items of litter. This is how I view truth, right? My engagement, it might be important, it might be inconsequential in the history of ideas, but at least I'm doing my small part to free the beach from the litter. That's what offends me. You know, with the idea of truth, I definitely believe that there exists the idea of some things are better than others. Now, I, I am, uh, you know, I was born in Nicaragua, uh, first generation immigrant. We fled a civil war as well in, in Nicaragua. One of the things that I used to say growing up is what's beautiful about my experience is I get to take the best of both worlds. But with the idea that's being passed on right now is, I'm now being racist to myself because <laughs> I'm saying that some things that everything's the same, all cultures are equal. Everything's, you know, it's, it, that's not the case. You know, if th it's one of the reasons I love to travel, I love to experience the world. If there's something that I can take <laughs> cultural appropriation that helps me and benefits me that I can learn from, that I can become a better person from that's great. Cause you know, again, I get to take the best. I get to cherry pick the best things from around the world. And I already felt I had a leg up just by being from two different cultures. I speak two languages. I'm sure you speak even more than two. Four. Um, four. So it seems, uh, you know, with the idea of truth, uh, you know, I definitely, you know, believe in that. There, There's a truth that some things are better in some places than others. Well, uh, look, uh, as someone who studies consumer psychology, I can state that uh, BMWs are preferred to Ladas, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, we start off with the premise that there are some products that are preferred to others, right? Well, by that same logic, if we look at the daily choices that people make in terms of their immigration patterns, that should tell us something about whether all cultures are equal or not. It seems to be the case that a lot more people are interested in moving to the United States and Canada than they are in moving to Saudi Arabia and North Korea. Uh, it doesn't take a fancy behavioral scientist or consumer psychologist or evolutionary psychologist to recognize that we can learn about reality by watching large groups of people make actual consequential decisions. And immigration patterns suggest that all cultures are not equal also known as what the average two-year-old knows. But again, in the quest to be politically correct, we can't say that, right? Uh, the burqa, by, by the way, this is, this is a literal position. Uh, not only is the burqa no different than the bikini, as a matter of fact, the bikini is a patriarchal tool of oppression, whereas the burqa is liberating. It is liberating because the burqa averts the male gaze. This is not taught at some quack madrasa in Pakistan. This is taught in every gender studies program at all of the elite universities that uh, levy $60,000 yearly tuition fees. So imagine how much we've removed ourselves from a common understanding of reality where professor can get up in front of his or her students and truly state that the burqa is more liberating than a bikini. 
That's what offends me. And there, there's a meme about that. You, you can, you can Google that. There, there's a cartoon. I, I've definitely seen that. At one quick, uh, quick interjection. Um, I think it's ABK says highly interesting. Please, please give your book's title and when it will be available. Oh, thank you for asking. The current title, which is a working title, so it could still change several times, is uh, the parasitic mind. Precisely for what we discussed earlier, the idea that minds can be parasitized by idea pathogens. Uh, I have to submit the first draft in October, uh, although I'm on track to probably get it out to my publisher a bit quicker. And so if, but let us suppose that it goes out in October, usually you probably have to add about another six months. So they get it, they read it, they ask me to make some changes, we go back and forth. So my, so I think in the best case scenario, I would say very early 2020 to spring 2020. So so at the very latest, I would say in a year from now, it should be out there. Okay, very good. And then there's a uh, Motard, uh, no message, but $2. Thank you very much. What I wanted to go back to, you mentioned uh, the Lisa, um, uh, was it Lisa? Lisa. Lisa. Or, um, you, or, you broke up, you broke up. Did you say yeah. something? I was gonna no. I was gonna go back to it was Lisa Littman at Brown when it, it to to put like a bigger microscope on this. Uh, did you know that recently they they replub the 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 journal Plus One republished that? So this was um just in in mid March. So they they changed the title before it was called uh, Gender Dysphoria, um or it was either Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria. It was very plain title. Now it says Parents Perceptions of children with rapid onset dysphoria. And I, I read the entire statement by Brown and they say, no, 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 we didn't do this. We're very open to academic inquiry. We didn't do this because the activists told us it, wa it wasn't that we were treading on a tough subject. We're committed to that. It was the methodology that was the problem. But I looked at all the changes and all the changes are basically wording changes, which makes it maybe read a little bit nicer but not once do they address any methodological problems that might have been in there. So yeah. I'm sorry, I don't believe them. No, it's complete BS. Uh, and I mean, I know of a lot of other cases in very prestigious journals where all sorts of, uh, some of these cases, you know, I can't share publicly because they're confidential and so on, but where I know that an editor was placed under tremendous pressure to change this content and this. So it, so to go back to your question earlier, Fritz, I mean, that is a form of censorship, right? It's not governmental censorship, but it's don't use that word, use that word. I, I always joke that uh, social justice epistemology works as follows. If you do, for example, a study on sex differences, the, the you know, there are certain uh, criteria by which you judge if a effect is statistically significant and so on. Well, social justice epistemology works very different. If the results support the social justice narrative, then you publish it as great science. If the, so if the research, if the findings don't support the social justice warrior narrative, you squash it. Or if you do publish it, then you try to get the people who published it fired because they're Nazis. And I mean, it sounds as though I'm being humorous and hyperbolic, but but I'm not, right? So I've seen it in my own uh, engagement with, for example, feminists. Uh, if I go up in, in front of a you know a, a huge audience made up of many hostile people, and I'm talking about evolutionary psychology, if I, for example, talk about uh, research that demonstrates that. Uh, evolutionarily speaking, women have definitely evolved a desire to engage in extra, the, the, the fancy, you know, biological term is extra pair copulations, right? To to go around and cheat in, in the back of the cabin, right? right. Like cuckolding, as they call it, right? The, right. the word mainstreamed, thanks to the alt-right. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. Right. So, so if, uh, if I, if I, explain using some evolutionary principle, some phenomenon that is in line with the feminist narrative, then I get, bravo, Dr. Saad, what a brilliant scientist you are. And then the exact next nanosecond through the other side of their mouth, if I say something else, for example, if I say, yes, but let it be known that on average, men have evolved a greater desire for sexual variety than women. Boo, boo, Nazi, Nazi. So I literally went, from a heroic scientist to a Nazi within six to seven nanoseconds. And the only thing that moved me from being a heroic scientist to a Jewish Nazi is <laughs> the fact that in the first case, 
I mentioned an evolutionary principle that is consistent with feminist ideology. And in the second case, it wasn't. And therefore, there you have it. So uh, the case of uh, uh, Littman is basically what I call Tuesday in my daily life. Yeah, your satire is incredible with its ability to predict the future as well. I think you should collect them uh, and, and compete with Nostradamus with, with this type of talent. Uh, and, and and that said, you know, I, I want to respect your time. I could be here all day with you. I know that, you know, you don't have all day. Uh, but if we if we are going to end on maybe a, uh, end on the penultimate uh, question here, sure. what are your thoughts on the female penis? <laughs> <laughs> An ultimate means second to last. Yeah, so I'm going to give you the. I, I know that that means I. Okay. I don't want to end on the female penis. Uh, so you have to end on. Do you want to give a context to your question based on some of my satire, or do you want me to explain it, or what? How do you <laughs> well, it's uh, it, it, it's connected to the idea of uh, you know how men are different from women, uh, and you know we could talk for another three hours on this topic. Uh, but I saw one of your Facebook posts where um, I think you maybe titled it. I'm just going to place this here and walk backwards. <laughs> right. right. Well, this is part of a, a class of satire that I do uh, where I talk about women with nine inch penises. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, for example, I came out recently and I apologize to the world because I uh, recognize that now in retrospect, now that I'm better educated by the Canadian senators who taught me that there is no such thing as male or female. Uh, and who mocked me and scoffed at me. And the social justice warriors actually thought that I looked bad in that interaction. Uh, so in any case, uh, I realize now that when I was looking for a uh, long-term partner, and then I ended up with my wife, that I was truly being transphobic because I specifically focused on female partners who had vaginas. Whereas now I know that women can either come with vaginas or with nine inch penises. But when I made the choice to marry my wife, I was truly restricting it to women with vaginas. And I had to apologize for the fact that my whole marriage was a transphobic sham. I don't, wow. I don't want to offend you, but you're a bigot. No, I, it's, it's, you're an ex post facto bigot, I think is specifically what that is. All right. So and for the last question, we'll end on this. Um, and I just wanted to get your take on this. Two of the like the most respected institutions, and maybe this applies to Canada as well, but in America, were the military and the universities. And right now, the military still enjoys the broad-based support, but universities on on the right, I, I, there's more Republicans that I think universities are a net negative than a net positive, and I, I definitely see that as a problem. Where do you stack up on that? Is is the university system a net negative or positive, or how would you nuance that? Uh, I mean, if we keep going down the the the, the trajectory that we're going, uh, I don't know if it's going to be net negative, but it's certainly not. Uh, it's not living up to what it could be, right? I mean, think of it this way: I don't know how many students have, over the past forty years, chosen gender studies and postmodernism and queer theory as their fields of topic. But life is about opportunity cost. Never mind the fact that you're spending your parents' hard-earned money to send you. Uh, to school, right? Uh, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that or racking up tons of debt, or back or exactly up back tons of debt. Uh, life is about opportunity cost. If I do, if I buy A, I didn't get chance to buy B. If I go to Island A, I didn't do Island B. And so, when you are making choices like going to queer theory and critical race theory and feminist glaciology, uh, you're not studying other things that you could have been studying. And I should be very clear here. I don't mean to imply, it's not as though I'm an elitist arguing that uh, only the natural sciences are valid or uh, you can't study philosophy or the humanities. You could study Shakespeare in a profoundly valuable way. You can study a dead language. You could study Sanskrit in a profoundly. So, so this is not a statement about uh, these are fields that are appropriate, these are not. But rather, they should all be rooted in a commitment to reason and logic. You can't always use the scientific method, right? In, in uh, art history, it might be a bit more difficult to use the scientific method, but you're still committed to a, a, a sense of truth, a, a pursuit of reason, of logic, and so on. The problem with postmodernism and critical race theory and queer theory and so on is that they're nihilist. They're what I call intellectual terrorism. And so I still think that the university 
taken as an aggregate as a net positive of course it has to be but if you murder one person's trajectory, you're already harming, you're causing great harm. There's one student who, because of whatever parasitic ideas they've been exposed to, could have studied something valuable, but instead studied how we can uh, queer the, uh, uh, the office space, right? And again, this is not an attack on transgendered people and so on. Uh, I'm the first person to be defending the right of the transgendered in the Middle East where I get death threats. But what I'm saying is that we should use the universities to grow intellectually, to, to in, in whichever way we want, whether we study a dead language like Latin or we study the neurosci neurosciences. What I don't want to see is more and more stu students wasting four years, six years, 10 years studying utter bullshit that will bring them nothing but despair. Yeah, it seems like there's just no no standard. I I I wonder what uh, Martin Luther King would think living today, or how he would be perceived by social justice warriors, with him today stating judge people, you know, by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. I have an answer for that. As a matter of fact, I don't. We don't have to hypothetically play the game of what would social justice warriors think. I think it was at the University of Oregon. You can double check by doing a Google search where uh, none other than Martin Luther King was uh, some statue or, or whatever. Some, something was going to be taken down of his because they felt that, I mean, precisely that exact quote, the I have a dream quote, was not inclusive enough. Wow. wow. So, Incredible. So that has already been answered for you. Incredible. Martin Luther King is not safe from the ire of the enemies of wow. reason. So, Dr. Dr. Sad. Where can we find you? Where can your fans find you? I, I see that you have a subscribe star. Is there anywhere else where uh, folks can find you? They're asking subscribe star. I know that a lot of people don't like Patreon anymore because of some of the shenanigans stuff that they've done. I'm still on Patreon. Uh, uh, they can also go to PayPal if they want to support my work. I have uh, a uh, merchandising store. For example, now people want to see as my next line what I call my belt of self-hate. If you've <laughs> ever seen me, whenever I now read some of the New York Times and the rest of these idiotic uh, outlets, I will read those articles while self-flagellating so they can purchase my merchandise there. Uh, they could follow me on Twitter at GADSAD, G-A-D-S-A-A-D. -A -A I have a public Facebook page and of course my YouTube channel. So you can't miss me, I'm everywhere. I haunt your dreams. The belt of self hate that that that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Thanks, thanks, Doctor Sad. I really appreciate it. I do think that you're right. I think everybody chipping in a little bit. This is kind of like recycling. It only works if we all throw our cans in. You know, just one city doesn't work. So um, yeah, I, I think fighting this, standing your ground, standing your intellectual ground. Don't give up. I love the I love the message. We I really appreciate the talk and and keep up the good work. Thank you. You guys have been a delight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's Thank been you. an honor. Cheers. Bye. Take care. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Okay. <sighs>